Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webcast, Surviving the Affordable Care Act, Labor Strategies for 2013, presented by John Frase. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this webcast has been approved for IHR certification credits, one HRCI webcast for certification credit, and one HRCI e-learning credit. You will receive an email within one to two business days of this webcast with the certification information, as well as a link to your certification profile page. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast to receive your credits. Questions may be submitted any time during the webcast by typing the question in the Ask a Question text field and clicking Submit, the orange button located on your screen. And I'll now turn it over to John, today's presenter. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, uh, and thank you to HR.com for hosting us today. Uh, the goal of any web session that I do is to make it impactful. So we are going to hit a little bit of the high-level stuff, but what I want everyone to leave here with are actionable tools, things that you can actually use to make a difference in your company. And there's a lot of things changing right now associated with the Affordable Care Act that are going to dramatically change the landscape of labor over the next five years. So we'll go through that information, um, starting with a brief introduction for the group. So what this is, it's a look at how the Affordable Care Act is going to change the shape of your workforce. Um, we're going to talk about true labor costs, which is something that we, we talk about regularly. Um, we run the Hall of Fame issue of Industry Week magazine about this topic, and it's something that, uh, that continues to be relevant. So we'll talk about true labor costs and calculations that you'll all be able to do um, as you move forward. Um, there's going to be some education in here on shift schedules as well. So considering what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act, there are some things that you may want to think about now before you're forced to think about them later. What this is not, it's not a political discussion about the Affordable Care Act. Um, we're not endorsing or renouncing the legislation. There, <clears throat> from my perspective and from my job's perspective, I don't really care either way about the Affordable Care Act politically. What I do care about are the very real implications of, of that act. Um, so I'll try to... Uh, to answer questions as we go here, but frankly, I don't think I'm going to be able to, uh, to, to do two things at once. We'll see how it goes. Um, at the end, I'd love to, to answer all the questions everybody has. So <clears throat> really the big issue is that the Affordable Care Act is supposed to decrease health care costs. On paper, it looks like that is what would happen. The problem is that the health insurers out there um, have taken this as an opportunity to raise health premiums as, as high as they possibly can. So. Here's some headlines that I grabbed, things like Verizon takes big profit hit from benefit costs. Benefit costs are going up, and a large portion of those are, are health care costs, and uh, <clears throat> they will continue to rise. In um, 2013, PricewaterhouseCooper um, says that health care costs on average are going to go up 7.5%, and we'll, we'll talk about why that matters a little later, but it definitely matters. So the health insurance sticker shock from the Wall Street Journal uh, Connecticut businesses fear rising health care costs um, and uh, dislike. So either way, point is, health care costs are going up. Part of that is due to the Affordable Care Act. Part of that is due to just the cost of care. Um, either way, the Affordable Care Act is definitely playing a role in that, and uh, we want to explore it for further here. So can we attribute the rising costs to the Affordable Care Act? Um, well, it was supposed to bring costs down, as I said. Um, as I mentioned, the 7.5% uh, average increase. In some states, that, that percentage is going to be much higher, and some it's going to be much lower. Um, but that's just in 2013. 2014, we're looking at uh, an even bit bigger number. Reason for rising costs, um, part of it is that there's a lot of new treatments out there that are incredibly expensive. They're included or mandatorily included in your health premiums. Um, there's a fear of government regulation. and then the, some of the new rules, like pre-existing conditions cannot be denied, um, everybody has to be covered. Uh, the, the idea was that it was going to go down because young people who typically do not have health insurance would be included in the pool at a lower risk and would drive costs down. Unfortunately, we're not seeing that yet. Um, so a couple of, couple of pieces on the going down. One I mentioned was the, the younger population. Um, the government oversight um, may actually be helpful here, and that is because there, there's a committee set up state by state that if you want to raise your health care premiums as a health insurer by more than 
you have to go through this committee. You can't just say, hey, we're raising our health insurance premiums by 20% this year. Um, you've got to go through the, the government regulation. So the, the challenge with the 10%, though, of course, is that's so high already. When you look at an annualized increase, that the damage is already you know, done at that point. Um, reasons for rising costs. Really, the focus here, we want to talk about you know, the pre-existing conditions. We, we mentioned that. Fear of government regulation, rising cost of care. All of these things are, are contributing to a very specific section that you all should carry about, care about, and that is the burden rate associated with true labor costs. And, and I want to get into some, some significant detail on that in the next couple of slides. So for us, all of our clients already provide health care. So we're, we're not concerned about the Affordable Care Act in that it's going to make you provide health care to your employees. Most of our clients, clients like Kraft Foods, General Electric, BMW, they provide care to just about everybody. So that's not the concern. The, the part-timers that they use, there's some concerns there because the regulation is going to be very um, specific around how many hours an individual works. If you're working less than 30 hours, you're considered part-time. But what happens if there's a busy season and you work 35 hours for an extended period of time? Um, that, that gets a little cloudy in the current legislation. There are some safe harbor rules um, about you know, being able to label somebody regardless of the hours they work in the future, but it's, it's going to be pretty confusing at least in the first year. So as, as costs continue to rise, these are the key assumptions here, the part-time pool will grow. And we're going to get into some more detail on that, but the reality is the 40-hour employee is going to be so expensive because as the benefit costs go up, you know, that's, that's more burden on the, on the total cost of having a full-time employee. And so when we have 40-hour employees, we're going to want to work them 50 hours. Well, self health and safety concerns are certainly part of that, but we're going to want to work them more and more hours because these fixed costs will have already been covered. So it's cheaper to have somebody work 50 hours a week, work a bunch of overtime, than it is to hire an additional employee and keep overtime low. So part-timers, we're not going to have to pay these more and more expensive benefits, so that's going to be a, an interesting pool of, of people, but really this, is, this could be the death of the 40-hour employee over the next five years, and, and I want to prove to you that, that this is the case through a very simple calculation. Okay? So there's three key considerations to true labor cost, and, and this matters for everyone on the phone. I don't care if you're in, in Canada or the United States, yes, Canada has its own health care system, but this is a calculation that everybody should care about on the, on the phone today. Um, we have three considerations. One is the average wage. I'm going to use $15 as an example. Okay? We also have the burden and the pay ratio. Okay? So the burden is everything from medical, dental, taxes, all those fringe benefits. I'm using 35%. That number is actually pretty low compared to what most of our clients use. Um, but I'm using 35% here. And then I've got the pay ratio, which is 15%. The pay ratio is the total hours that you pay an employee over the hours they actually work. Okay, so this ratio takes into account things like paid time off, vacations, holidays, you may have paid sick leave policies. All of those things are included in the pay ratio. So when you multiply all three of those things together, you get $15 times 1.35 for the 35% and then you get 1.15 for the 15%. And again, your numbers are going to be different than this, so make sure you understand what's included on straight time and overtime, uh, but your numbers will be different than this. When you put it all together, the fully loaded cost of one employee for one hour working, in this case, is $23.29. So it's, it's much more expensive than $15, but it's because we have to pay for all those benefits um, as they, they go through uh, their time at work. Now, over time, it's a little different. Okay, so it's $15 times 1.5 for time and a half. And here's where we, we start to think a little differently, okay? You don't have to include all that burden, the 35% and the pay ratio, because a lot of those things are fixed costs, right? I don't get two Christmases because I work overtime. Um, I don't get to see two doctors when I'm sick because I work overtime. Um, those are fixed costs. The only thing that we really have to pay are some taxes and potentially some 401k. If you're in Canada, this number is going to be closer to 15% instead of 10% um, based on some of the taxes that you pay. Um, in the United States, you're really looking at things like FICA and 401k. It gets to about 10%.
we put those numbers together at twenty-four dollars and seventy-five cents. Okay, so to progress this even further, we look at adverse costs. Okay, so let's say Kathy, who introduced me today, is a plant manager as an example. It could be any industry, but let's say she's a plant manager. And I am a packaging operator at the end of a manufacturing line. And Kathy says, hey, John, um, if you work for one hour, I'm going to pay you $23.29 in pain benefits for every hour you work. Right? So the adverse cost of straight time is she pays me $23.29, and I give her $23.29 worth of work, right? because we said that one hour of my time is worth $23.29. The adverse cost of straight time is zero for this reason. What about idle time? Let's say there's some downtime on the line, and I stand there for an hour, and I don't do anything. The adverse cost of idle time, she pays me $23.29. I guess what? I don't do any work, right? And so she, she loses the entire $23.29. There's no benefit given to her. What about the adverse cost of overtime? When we look at overtime, the adverse cost is simply the cost of overtime, and then you subtract out the cost of straight time or that benefit that I gave to Kathy. Okay, so if I gave her $23.29 worth of benefit, and she had to pay $24.75 because of that overtime premium, the adverse cost is only $1.46. Okay, so when we, when we think about it, you know, straight time or idle time is $23.29, overtime on an adverse cost basis is only $1.46. That means that idle time is 16 times more expensive than overtime. Okay? So when we think about that, what does that mean from a management perspective? How do we make decisions? Now, when I speak to large groups of, 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 of managers, they typically say things to me like, this means we get to work all the overtime we want. And I say, hey, that is simply not the case. We're not telling you you get to work all the overtime you want. What we're saying is idle time is 16 times more expensive. That's really where you should be focusing your energy. So when we, when we think about it, it's not about overtime. It's about straight time, um, and it's really about that idle time calculation. So it's, it's obviously a critical issue. It's one that people have mis, misrepresented over time. They don't understand it, and it's something that we really need to rethink. So as we go further with this, and I'm going to tie this back into the Affordable Care Act shortly, as we go further with this, we need to talk about what happens as those, those benefit costs go up. Okay, so what happens when that 35% rises by 7.5% this year, and then 7.5% next year, and on and on and on? Well, that $1.46 that was the adverse cost of overtime, now we're talking about maybe zero. Maybe now the issue is the adverse cost of overtime is negative. On a year-over-year -year basis, that's where we're headed. Okay, considering your benefit load is probably higher than, than this right now, you may already be at zero. But what I'm pushing on, on everybody on this call today, all 180 of you, okay, is that in the next five years, at every single organization in North America, if you have a full-time workforce, the cost of overtime will be cheaper than straight time, which poses some very difficult questions for you. Number one, do you have labor strategies that allow you to take advantage of the adverse cost of overtime being negative? Number two, do you have the discipline to not tell your employees, hey, you get to work all the overtime you want? Not only does it affect health and safety, but productivity. Right? So we have to do this in a measured way. And guess what? No one is talking about this. No one is talking about the fact that the 40-hour employee, from a financial perspective, will be dead in the next three to five years. It just will happen that way. As people learn about this strategy, they'll either exploit it in an irresponsible way, or they, they won't exploit it, they'll learn about it, and they'll use it effectively and in a measured way. And that's what we're hoping you all do. So what's interesting is, you know, this, this is taken from an article um, that I wrote, these charts, but you, know, you can think about it. Do we, do we staff to the peak, that red line, and we have a ton of idle time? Do we staff, staff at the trough? and have high amounts of overtime, but minimize our adverse labor costs. Well, with the calculations I gave you before the 35% goes up, with the calculations I gave you, the adverse cost of overtime with, with the $1.46 would drive us 
to being slightly off the trough. Our address costs about $146,000. So we're not going to staff at the trough, but we're going to staff slightly above that if we're just thinking financially about this. Now, if we continue just to think financially about it, in the example we gave before, right, with the 2329, as the benefit costs go up, and I have a chart here that represents that, you can see that at the 9% point, really 9 points, when I get 9 points higher than the 35% I'm at right now, my adverse cost of overtime goes negative. Okay, so you should have these charts. You should know when this is going to happen, and you should understand the implications to, to you as an organization. Okay? So, going back to this chart, the problem with everything we've talked about and the warning that we should all be aware of, right, is what the Affordable Care Act is really telling us is that we should staff well below the peak. We should have as few people as possible in our organization. Now, we all know, right, that that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to talk about, okay? But we have to balance these things. Okay, so I've beaten this thing dead probably, but um, <clears throat> The other key point is, great, so overtime may be an effective tool within reason, but do employees actually want to work it, right? And that is very important uh, to consider. So it's nice that financially we can save all this money if we work a ton of overtime, assuming that demand requires it. But if the employees hate overtime, you know, we've got another problem on our hands. Um, so this is from our normative database, and basically we asked employees, and we've asked over 100,000 employees in North America alone this question, um, <coughs> would you, um, do you feel like you're working more overtime than you would like, less than you would like, or the right amount? And you can see 28% are saying they're working more overtime than they would like. Um, about 38% is less overtime than they would like, and about 34% say they're working just the right amount. Now, what, we've, what we really learned as we surveyed you know, different companies, call centers, manufacturing, mining, distribution, utility, all these different industries, is it wasn't really by industry that we saw the, the deviation. There was, no, um, there, was, there was nothing that correlated there. It really was every single company we worked with was different just because it was different. You could have two companies next door to each other in the same town making the same thing or doing the same thing, and the employees may feel incredibly differently about overtime. So as much as we have benchmarks, we've never met the average shift worker. And I want to make that clear. It's very important to understand what your employee's appetite is and to not assume that our norms equal what your employees feel. So we survey the workforce wherever we go. Um, what about when they work less than 40 hours? Now, we've got a lot of companies that we work with, and they say, listen, we don't really have idle time because when there's no work to do, we send the employees home. And we say, hey, listen, it's, it's better to send them home than to have them stand here and do nothing. Of course, if you're assuming morale doesn't change, which we know it does. But it's not free to send employees home. When we send employees home, we're still paying for all their benefits. So on a per hour cost, those, those, those dollars become more expensive. So I, you can see from this chart, which is very confusing, by the way, but it's the only way I've figured out uh, how to explain this. The, the lighter green, or whatever green that is, uh, line, is just hours, 45 hours all the way down to um, 30 hours, okay? And so in that situation, all we're saying is as you work fewer and fewer hours, what happens to the per hour cost for that employee? So 2475 is the fully loaded cost of overtime. So from 45 hours to 41 hours, it's $24.75 an hour. We get to 40, it's $23.29, our fully loaded cost for one hour. What happens when we work fewer hours? Well, we've got to take all of those fixed cost benefits and we're going to spread them over fewer hours. And so you can see the cost goes up. And it goes up as we end up going through the, the hours. It goes up. Uh, when you get to 34 hours, you're back at that adverse cost or the fully loaded cost of overtime, 24.75. And let's say an employee only works 30 hours. Well, on a per hour basis, you're going to be spending an additional just about $3 an hour more for that employee. So sending them home, it can be a good strategy, but if you're doing it a lot, let's make sure we all understand that that is not free. Okay? It, it costs money because all those fixed cost benefits that you're incurring are spread over fewer hours. 
So what about employees willing to work fewer hours? So assuming this, this benefit cost is going to be so high and that full-time employees are going to be so expensive, you know, could we convince some of our employees to work a part-time or seasonal schedule that would be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act and we don't have to pay their benefits? Okay. Um, we've asked employees this question. And the answers, unfortunately, for management are not looking very good. What they're telling us is, you know, 10% uh, would be willing to work some kind of seasonal schedule. But from a part-time perspective, it's really less than 10% of the workforce is willing to work, you know, less than 30 hours on a regular basis. Um, you're always going to find some employees that say, hey, listen, I, I, I just want to, you know, work 30 hours and get my health benefits. You, you see very few employees that say, I'll work 20 hours with no benefits, very few. Typically around retirement age is when somebody's just looking to do something some days of the week. So if overtime is the transformative topic associated with the Affordable Care Act, do you have a shift schedule or any type of labor strategy that can take advantage of overtime in a way that works for the business but also really works for the employees? Um, so what I, what I do typically is when we're talking to, let's say, three or 400 people, um, we do a survey. And we can't, we're not going to do that today just based on time. We're going we're gonna to make sure we go through this um, and everybody can ask questions at the end. But you have to think to yourself, what would be more attractive for me? I don't think about anybody else, but for you who's on this call today, um, would you prefer to work an eight-hour shift Monday through Friday? OK, an eight-hour shift Monday through Friday um, it's, you can ignore all the information at the top. That's some of the demarcation that we use when we're talking about shift schedules. Um, but on an eight-hour shift, you get all your weekends off. You work 260 days a year, 104 days off. I said that you get all your weekends off, and your longest break is two days, those weekends. And you never work more than five shifts in a row. Now, this is, of course, the base schedule. In reality, you've got to work a little overtime here and there if you're in a, in a seasonal or variable model. But that's one option, 260 work days, 104 off, all my weekends off, I never work more than five shifts in a row. So another option that doesn't change the business needs, but is very different from an employee perspective, is a 12-hour shift. On a 12-hour shift, I work Monday to Wednesday, and then I get a six-day weekend. I get Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday off. I work three days, I get my weekend off, just like the eight-hour shifts. I work two, down in that third week of my rotation, I get Wednesday off. They always say that's the honey-do list day, right? That's when you get all your chores done. You work two, and then you get the weekend off. Okay, so on the eight-hour shift, I work 260 days. On the 12-hour shift, I actually get 87 more days off a year. So I get 191 days off. I get all my weekends off, just like the eight-hour shifts, but my longest break, instead of being two days, is six days, and that happens 17 times. Now, some people say, hey, 12-hour shifts, that's that's a little bit long for me. Um, I don't want to work a lot of them in a row. Well, in this example, I'm only working three shifts in a row before I get some period of time off. So I'm not saying it's for everyone. Typically, we survey, we get a split in the room, or it's 70-30, 30-70. 30-70. The point is that there's a lot of different options out there for employees that don't affect the business, but absolutely affect the employees. And if we can get things for them that are more attractive, it's going to be a differentiator. Again, if you're going to be spending a lot of money for those employees, the Affordable Care Act is part of that situation, let's make sure that we're getting the best employees that really want to be here. And one of the things that is, is big for them is predictability. So if we can get schedules that give them more days off, more predictability, they like that. Um, so why is the eight-hour shift dying? Right? As, as part of this Affordable Care Act piece, where we might have higher unemployment, right? because you have fewer full-time employees being employed, right? They're going to work more overtime, which means you need fewer employees. Um, but why would the eight-hour shift die? Well, 260 versus 173 for work days is one thing, right? The second thing is when you work overtime on an eight-hour shift, typically that means working the weekend. On an eight-hour shift, higher gas prices mean you can save thousands of dollars by, by commuting much fewer times with 12-hour shifts. If you live far away, you may be able to save $2,000 approximately, depending on gas prices this week, um, by being on a 12-hour shift instead of an 8-hour shift over the course of a year. Um, flexibility is often only horizontal. So I talked about working the weekends. Horizontal flexibility means that you flex out to the side to the weekend. 
Um, vertical or density flexibility means flexing up more hours each day or increasing the number of employees at a specific time. That's not really possible with eight-hour shifts. And then there's overall less overtime opportunities with eight-hour shifts. So, so I write this article for Industry Week called The Death of the Eight-Hour Shift, right? And it was, we got, probably, I think we got over a thousand emails about this. Uh, but what people basically said was, I'm trying to get this done in my facility, but, you know, management doesn't understand. Um, I did have one person that wrote an editorial back to Industry Week um, about the article, and here's the things that they said. So I want to tackle these things because, again, Affordable Care Act, we're going to have to make some dramatic changes. 12-hour shifts may be part of that for you. Um, this guy said, hey, 12-hour shifts are too long, and they increase mistakes. Um, what we actually find is that 12-hour shifts have less mistakes, and the reason is, at the beginning of your day and at the end of your day is where most of your mistakes are made. Okay, that's just a fact. So if we have fewer start and stop times throughout the day because two 12-hour shifts is less than three eight-hour shifts, we actually have found through our studies that there's fewer mistakes on 12-hour shifts. Now if you put people on five or six 12-hour shifts, that's something else, and that's not what we're talking about. You've gotta be reasonable as you deploy these types of strategies. Um, Another thing this person said was, no one wants to work the weekend, so let's just build enough inventory Monday through Friday. If you're in a call center, this doesn't make sense. If you're in a manufacturing facility, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't really make sense anywhere, okay? We're in a demand-driven world right now, and where customer demand is is where we need to be. And so you can't just do that. So I forgot, I have false shows up as I go through this. Um, the weekend warrior could cover weekend requirements if it was absolutely necessary. So the weekend warrior is where everybody works like Monday through Thursday on 10 or 12 hour shifts, and then we hire other people to handle the weekend because we don't want to do it. Well, the problem is, is twofold. One is that those people are lower skilled typically, they're the newest employees, and they make a lot of mistakes. Secondly, this weekend warrior is typically for people that have another job somewhere. And so on the weekend warrior, you have high turnover, low skill, large scrap, low customer service, all these problems. So the weekend warrior, I've seen it work in one place, by the way. If you've ever seen um, Airstream trailers, those old classic trailers, they're in Ohio, and they use the Weekend Warrior successfully, but it's very, very rare. Um, your health is worse if you work a 12-hour shift. That's absolutely not true. When we look at health and safety issues, the biggest health issues come from working night shift. And over the last three or four years, those studies have exploded, really originating out of the UK, but there's a lot of stuff in North America about it now, too, that say that, um, if I work a night shift, I am five times more likely to have gastroenterological issues like stomach cancer, colon cancer, but I'm also more likely to have breast cancer. Um, and that, we're, we're really trying to separate the night shift from some things that happen because you're on the night shift. So one issue is, hey, if I'm awake at night, my melatonin production is different, and that may be a cause of cancer. There's no conclusion there. The other question is, hey, if I'm on the night shift, Am I going to the all-you-can-eat salad bar, or am I grabbing a double cheeseburger? There's not a lot of healthy options at 3 in the morning, and so we know that health habits are worse on night shift. We also know that people tend to be more tired, and they don't want to go to the gym and do all those extra things that typically are associated with longevity or health. So it's not about the 12-hour shift. It's really about your start time. Um, and then you need more staff to utilize 12-hour shifts. That's just simply wrong. Okay, mathematically, that doesn't make sense. You need the same number of people if you're covering 24 hours a day by five days, 24 hours a day for five days, six days, or seven days. The number of, sh of people you need is the same. Okay, mathematically, that just doesn't make sense. So, I talked about flexing out on eight-hour shifts. This is a graphical representation of that. But we also talk about the 12-hour shift, and on the 12, Right, there's different ways to do it. And by the way, I'm not here to sell you on 12-hour shifts. I'm just here to tell you that they're not the evil thing that they've been made out to be. Um, you can look at flexing out to the weekends, but you can also look at something we call density flexibility, which is bringing in more people during the week to cover for unexcused absences or vacations um, without having people you know, come in four hours early, stay four hours late, and do all those things. They can really work more effectively um, with this particular strategy. So, you know, there's, there's things that are good about this. There are things that are a challenge with this. A 12-hour shift is definitely longer, but, 
you know, it's it's different for every employee. And you know, when I when I'm speaking to large groups, we do the show of hands, and every seventy percent of the people say that they want to work the twelve hour shift. I say, well, have you offered this to your employees? Considering what's happening in the world right now, and the fact that overtime is is really going to be an effective tool, have you looked at the twelve hour shift? And they say, well, we don't offer that to our employees. And I said, well, seventy percent of you in this room wanted a twelve hour shift, but you don't think it's good enough for your employees? Maybe it's time to think differently. So I want to talk a couple couple more minutes on, on actual shift schedules. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left in this in this session. For companies that are looking at seven day operations, okay, and if you go back to this one, the re the reason people look at 12 hour shifts is they look at them because they are going to seven day operations. If you're a five day operation, my guess is you don't work 12 hour shifts. I think this schedule personally for me, I'll take the circles off of it. I think this schedule for me, and I can only speak for me, is incredibly attractive. Okay? But that's me. Somebody else may hate it. But you know, management teams don't start exploring these kinds of options unless they have to. And I'll tell you why they have to. It's because of this. This is called the Southern Swing. Okay? So again, surviving the Affordable Care Act is going to be very difficult with this particular model. The reason is that you work seven eight-hour shifts in a row three times over a four-week period. It's called the Southern Swing. There's a little bit of overtime built in. You only get one quarter of your weekends off. Okay? But um, it, uh, it does accomplish 24 by 7 um, coverage uh, using eight-hour shifts. So the reason why people look at 12-hour shifts on seven-day operations is because most employees have an allergic reaction to this specific model. They think it's terrible. Uh, so if we, if we move to a 12-hour option on seven days, they can get twice as many weekends off. They don't have to work a bunch of 12s in a row either. Um, this particular model, you work, if we start on week one, I'll start on Tuesday. You work two 12s, you get two days off. You work three 12s, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you get two days off. You work two, and then you get a three-day weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, heading back up to your first week of your two-week rotation. So you never work more than three 12s in a row. You get half your weekends off, and you work 182 days, and you get 182 days off. So half the time I'm working, half the time I'm off. It's really a 50-50. And my longest break, is three days, so I'm going to get 26 three-day weekends. That's like getting 26 Memorial Day weekends um, before you actually take all those those weekends off as well. So there's some real positives there. So another way to look at the seven-day strategy is um, to look at uh, working a bunch of 12s in a row and getting a bunch of days off. So working four 12s and getting seven days off in a row, working four 12s, getting three days off, Working three, down in week four you get a day off, work three and you get a three-day weekend. So this is another way to look at 12-hour shifts um, that accomplishes that 24 by 7 coverage requirement, but you're able to fill in overtime. You know, people are getting seven days off. Not everybody loves that, you know, and it shocked me the first time I heard this, but I had somebody stand up in, a, in an employee meeting I was doing at a couple hundred employees in Iowa, the middle of Iowa, and somebody stood up and said, I hate this model. And I said, what do you not like? Do you not like the 12-hour shifts? And the person, I'll keep this gender neutral for the crowd, the person said, listen, I love my spouse. I just don't love them seven days in a row. True story. And I thought, oh, no, this is not what you want to announce to your entire employee population. But uh, the reality is some people work harder at home than they do at work. Some people would love to have three days off, but after that, it's just too much. They want to come back to work. So this Things like this can look really attractive, but there may be some problems too. Like, what if I'm on night shift, going from week three to week four? I work three, I get a day off, and then I work three again. That's not really a day off in the middle there. Do I have time to, you know, get my day shift sensibilities about me and have a real day off? Probably not, right? So we have to be thoughtful about that as well. So, let's go forward. So what do, what do employees tell us? So as we go into this brave new world, the Affordable Care Act is going to drive higher overtime. It's going to drive fewer full-time employees. 
it's going to create a larger part-time pool, but this high overtime pool for the, the full-timers. What do the employees think? You know, how can we get the best employees? If we're going to have fewer of them, we want to make sure every single one of them counts. Okay? So what do they like and what do they not like? Well, let's, say, let's find out what they're saying right now. Okay? So the client is the light-colored bar. The normative database is the blue. Let's just focus on the blue um, because the individual client shouldn't really matter uh, to individuals on this call. Um, so are you getting enough time off? 52.4% said yes. That is a terrible number. If you see the scaling only goes to 80 on this chart. These are all bad numbers. Um, is it quality time off? 46% said yes. It's dreadful. Fit in with your family and social life? Less than half said yes, it fits in. Is it flexible? Less than half said yes. Do I get effective training? Even with training, only 60% said yes. So these are not great numbers and we've got to find a better way. And I really think this is a story about rigid, this is how we've always done it, schedules that don't fit into the lifestyles of the employees we have today. So, next, let's go back up one. So, I want to spend the last, really, five or six minutes um, talking about a checklist. This is something that I think everybody should print out. We'll give you a copy of the deck. Um, if you, you may be able to download it. If not, um, we'll find a way that you can. Um, but there's some key issues, and I want to walk through each one of these with you. This is a hidden cost list for manufacturing. We have them. If you're not in manufacturing, shoot us an email. We'd love to get you a different checklist for your specific industry. We have them for every industry out there where you don't work a traditional 9 to 5 schedule. But this is something we recommend you print out. You sit down with the rest of your management team. Everybody gets a sheet and say, where are our biggest hidden costs? And you might be surprised at what you hear. First of all, you might be hearing things like, hey, overtime is the biggest problem for us. We have too much overtime. Well, from a health and safety perspective, let's think about it that way. But let's not assume that we have too much overtime if it's all about cost. Okay, right? Because we've learned today that overtime is, is about to change the world. And uh, we need to be incredibly sensitive about that. So high overtime is one thing. Inventory levels, right? In the old days, what we said is, everybody works a 40-hour work week. When people want more or less of something, our inventory levels will go up and down. Okay? Well, now what we're saying is, let's keep inventory really low, and let's make our employees go up and down. Well, the problem is, of course, that employees don't like to go up and down, especially when they're on an eight-hour shift, and overtime means that they're working six days a week, only getting one day off to be with their families, or if they're single, just to rest. So we've got to find other ways, and inventory levels are one of the things that are driving people away from traditional shift scheduling. Affordable Care Act, of course, is, is going to be, if it hasn't already in the last year, one of the major driving forces. Another one is the inability to staff efficiently, <coughs> excuse me, for seasonal, monthly, weekly, or daily demand. So that flexibility. Do you have the flexibility in your current model, or is it like a fire drill? Um, we find that companies that traditionally believe, because they were taught in school, that as they increase out their five-day operation, they increase to six or seven days, well, the academics would tell you that you're going to make a lot more money because you've already paid for all the fixed costs associated with your operation, the building, the equipment, etc. Problem is, you end up spending a lot more for labor because it's usually you have the wrong people, there's absenteeism, the wrong number of people, and you've got a lot of scrap. And so, that's a big concern um, for everyone as well. No full-time, part-time temp strategy. We strongly believe that's going to change rapidly. You're going to be forced to have that strategy if you don't have it now. Um, employees working less than 30 hours a week, again, without getting into the legal stuff around safe harboring, I think that's really important um, to understand what a safe harbor category would be for your part-time employees. So if they have to work more than 30 hours occasionally, that's okay. Okay, but we don't want them working 35 hours, 40 hours regularly, and we're classifying them as part-time. That would be a violation. But you can safe harbor employees and categorize them as part-time, even if they work more than 30 occasionally. Um, what about uneven skills? Um, you know, the reason why people rotate their schedules right now, and there's not a lot of companies that do anymore, where you work from days to afternoons to nights or whatever it might be, um, is because of skills. Nuclear power plants do that. Why? Because they can't afford to have all the new guys on night shift. You know, when did Chernobyl happen? Three Mile Island, Exxon Valdez, all of those things were night shift accidents. 
So what do we learn? We need to rotate shift schedules only in areas where skill is critical. Um, that's why so few people do it today, but you know, it's, it's very, very important uh, to at least understand what your uneven skill issue is. Idle labor time. In our example, we said it was 16 times more expensive. So, you know, as with Affordable Care Act, those employees are going to be more and more expensive. What are you doing to look at minimizing idle time? Or what some people, Greg Gordon at Kronos is a guy I lecture with regularly. He calls it absorption. Are you absorbing the first 40 hours of that employee's work? Or are you so worried about overtime that you've overstaffed your population and you've got a ton of idle time? It's something to think about. And idle time doesn't necessarily mean people are standing around doing nothing. It may mean that there's a lower level of productivity because of your labor strategy. It depends. Hard to recruit and retain. Obviously, if you're selling plain vanilla like everybody else, um, it's going to be hard to recruit and retain good employees. Differentiate. We think you should do that with shift schedules. Um, outdated HR policies. You know, we didn't spend any time on that today. I, I won't beat you all over the head with this one, but if you're going to look at a 12-hour shift, there's a lot of things you need to look at around HR policies. Um, with your eight-hour shifts, if you're paying things like shift differentials on second and third shift, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Um, most companies, by the way, if they do pay a shift differential, they pay more to third than they do to second shift, more to night shift than they do to evening shift, even though in North America, Canada included, the night shift is preferred two to one over second shift. So why would they get more than second shift in a shift premium if you're paying it because of the desirability issue around the shift schedule? It doesn't make any sense logically at all. Um, and it doesn't solve the problem anyway. So we're, we're strongly against shift premiums. They, they don't achieve what you want to accomplish. Um, past changes, uh, that's very client specific. Consolidation or blending is as well. Um, not maximizing current capital. Uh, do you get to a five-day operation and say we're all out of capacity? Or are you completely maxed out at seven days? Um, looking at startups and shutdowns, uh, I, I spent last Friday meeting with one of the top supply chain guys in the country. And what was interesting for me is um, where we do lean labor and we look at um, supply chain from the labor side, you know, this guy's sort of my, my nemesis because he's, he's saying, you know, we have to do a ton of, uh, you know, skew changes. We've got to constantly change the, the mix. Um, and I'm saying, you know how much that costs us on the labor side? So there's, there's a balance there as well. And I think the supply chain team has won this fight for a long time. But over the last, I think, 18 months, we've been, we've been trying to turn the tables on them and say, hey, you can't disrupt human beings 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all to save, you know, $3 million if it's costing you $4 million in labor. So I, I think that's a good area to push back. Um, forecasting is a disaster wherever we go. I think the, the worst we've seen it is, I think, a 27% accuracy in forecast. Um, but it, it's all across the board, depending on your industry. Um, productivity speaks for itself. What about absenteeism? Right? If I'm paying somebody, my benefit load is, let's say, 80%, which is not unheard of. And somebody decides not to show up for work, I may pay them $20 an hour depending on what I'm, their rates are, I may pay them $20 an hour to sit on the couch because they decided not to show up today. So on an eight-hour shift with a company that has high benefits, right, that's $160 in benefits that you're paying for someone not to show up to work. Okay, absenteeism is going to become a bigger and bigger issue for you over the next year, certainly over the next five years. Okay, you've got to get a hold of it now. Health and safety issues, you've got to watch out for this one, folks. You know, we're talking about a lot of overtime coming up if we don't restrain ourselves. Health and safety is number one. It's ahead of productivity. We've got to keep our pe people healthy and safe. And when you look at the financials, it's going to encourage us to make bad decisions. So let's make sure that we're cautious about that. We monitor it carefully. Morale issues, they've got them now. They're going to have them in the future. The question is why. Um, we survey employees to figure this out and make changes. You probably have some of those strategies. Um, and so on and so forth. There's a couple on communication and vacation, lunch, and break staffing. Green room time is simply the time before you go to work when you do a huddle. Um, those are all things. So print this out. Have the debate with your teams and find out, you know, what, do, do we all agree where the biggest issues are? You may all have different ideas, but it's a good exercise. So I want to answer some questions. Um, I 
Fred Hayden is on the phone today, but if you, if you want a copy of the presentation, you may already have it, but if you want a copy, um, you can email fred at corepractice.com. That's C-O-R-E as in Edward, practice.com. Uh, and uh, he'd be happy to help you. He's out of Chicago, and so the time zones are a little different, um, but hopefully uh, you get a copy. So I want to answer some questions. Um, Kathy, where should I start in here? Was there a copy? All right. So is there a copy of the presentation available to print now? No. Um, so for, for Lori, um, we, will, uh, we will get that available to everybody. If you email fred at corepractice.com, we'll send you the exact copy of the presentation. Um, for Anne, what happens when I offer a plan that is approved affordable and, and meets the 60%, et cetera, but my employees refuse to accept it and they go to an exchange? Okay. Um, that, that actually, that legislation is changing right now. But if they, if they refuse what you have and they go to an exchange, right now, you're not liable. Okay, so there's no cost to you. It's basically turning down coverage right now is the same as turning down coverage in the future. So if you're offering it to them and they're not accepting it, you've done your part in this and the employee's going it alone. It's like if I'm married and my wife has a great health plan and I decide to go to her health plan instead of mine, my company is not liable for me going to the other health plan. They're fine-tuning that right now, though, because they're starting to see some loopholes with it. Okay. The sound keeps cutting out. I'm sorry about that. Um, I hope that got fixed, Charlene, because now I've done the whole thing, and I'm just hearing about it now. Um, okay. You're saying I barely touched on the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is a giant 500 pages is the small version. The key for us is labor strategy. So we can talk about, you know, 500 pages worth of legislation, or we can talk about the things that are really going to matter to you individually as you plan your labor strategies. And so the focus of this, again, in 45 minutes, is to really get at individual labor strategies that you can employ today. If I tried to talk about the regulations the whole time, you would all leave here with nothing that you could actually use. So I appreciate if you came here, hey, I want an academic experience that's just about the legislation. Um, but our focus today is on labor strategy. How do we survive this? Uh, and the way to do that is, is with the things we talked about. Okay. Um, I'm very interested in the copy of today's slides and hidden cost checklist for the food service industry. Okay, food service is about 55% of the business we do. So Jill, please make sure you copy you, you email Fred, we'll get you everything you need. We do a ton of work in that, that space. And um, thank you for uh, enjoying the, 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 the presentation today. Um, call center environment for Lisa. And this is the last question. So if you have any more questions, now's the time to ask them. Um, the call center is, we actually, I ran strategic services for Blue Pumpkin um, about 10 years ago. And we do a lot of work there. Bell Canada is actually one of our clients, as is AT&T. Um, a lot of the Blue Cross Blue Shields, we do a lot of work in that space. Um, and we have a hidden checklist, hidden cost checklist for that as well. So Lisa, please uh, email Fred. We don't have your email addresses available on this. So Fred can definitely get you a copy of that. And I can, I can add some specific insights around things like service level, um, ASA, everything. We've got a whole other set of things there. So I want to pass it over to Kathy. I want to thank everybody for joining. We had a really good turnout today. And for those of you that wanted a more technical experience um, around, you know, sort of page by page, uh, I know there's other Affordable Care Act things on HR.com. Um, this is really, again, about labor strategies for surviving. So, Kathy, passing it over to you. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that the archive webcast will be available on the HR.com site within 24 hours. And again, that's located under the archive webcast listings. And as John has mentioned, if you wish to have a copy of the slides, please email Fred and his address, email address is posted on the screen now. Uh, please remember if you're looking to obtain the HRCA Learn Credit for this webcast and other webcasts, you will need to do so by upgrading to the Certification Preparation Membership. A link to access this as well as the quiz for the webcast will be available in the follow-up email. We do appreciate your feedback, so if you could please take a minute at the very end of the webcast to complete the evaluation survey, that would be appreciated, and it will just pop up and appear on your screen. 
Thank you once again for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.